Hello, good morning everybody. Welcome to Ad America TV. Hi, I'm Maya Trainer. I'm one of the e-guides here at Ad America, and we welcome our audience joining us online. We truly hope that you are doing well and staying safe amidst this outbreak. Well, anyway, for those of you who are first-timers here, hi, welcome to Ad America TV for the first time. Ad America is the U.S. Embassy's American Center. Our mission is to provide a space for young generations of Indonesia to learn more about the United States. We have temporarily moved to a solely digital platform so you can enjoy our program from the comfort of your own home and help fund the curve of COVID-19. Don't forget to leave your questions in the comment box below and our panelists will answer them later in the seminar. And for our friends here who are joining us for Zoom, there are a couple of features that you can use to actively participate in the seminar. You can use the raise hand section to ask your questions with your video on. Or you can also use the chat box section whenever you wanted to say hi to the other participant and also the panelist as well. But please keep in mind to use these features wisely. All right? Cool. Now, today we will be having a session titled EduFish Series Virtual Tour with Monterey Bay Aquarium. But as per usual, before we begin, we are going to have a social media quiz. Are you guys ready? Okay, here we go. The question is, which state is home to Monterey Bay Aquarium? Is it A, Illinois, B, California, C, Hawaii, or D, Washington? I will repeat the question one more time. Listen carefully. Which state is home to Monterey Bay Aquarium? Is it A, Illinois, B, California, C, Hawaii, or D, Washington? You can participate this quiz through our social media comment section and stay tuned until the end of this program to find out if you got the answers right. Now, one more thing before we begin, please don't hesitate to take a selfie, capture this moment, and share through your social media and let everyone know that you're having a great time with Ad America. And feel free to tag us on Instagram at AT America. And now, without further ado, please welcome our moderator for today, Ibu Fini Lovita. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, I'm going to now. Uh, uh, sorry. It's a pleasure to have you all here. I'm Lofita. I'm uh, working for Seafood Watch program, uh, Montreal Aquarium, as the senior fellow of the Sustainable Fisheries based in Jakarta. Uh, I have 20 years of experiences in marine and this program in Indonesia, and uh, I got my bachelor degree from University of Indonesia and my master degree from the uh, IPB University. So uh, for this event, I will be the moderator of the program. It means you all will see me, you will see my face, hear my voice, and listen to my instruction for the next uh, one and a half hours. So please don't get bored with me. Um, uh, before the program ends. I will now introduce you to our presenter. We have uh, Shelly Dearheart here. Uh, I will let Shelly to introduce uh, herself. Please, Shelly. Hey there, thank you, Penny. And uh, Salamat Pagi. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and see all of your names on this on this Zoom session and to talk with you all um, and just start some conversations about marine conservation. And um, I I know there are so many uh, next generation ocean conservation leaders that are on this call right now, and I'm just so excited to have you here. And um, I've been with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch team now for about two and a half years and uh, decided to share the aquarium and again, um, ocean. Thanks, Penny. Thanks, Shelly. And we also have here pa Erwin Widodo. Uh, he's going to help us during this whole uh, program. So I would like to uh, ask Erwin to introduce himself by Erwin. By Erwin. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Erwin Widodo. 
Uh, I used to be a marine biologist, but now turned out as a seascape uh, conservation uh, programs uh, activist. I love shark, like you see in my background. I'm actually deep underwater now, <laughs> but uh, uh, very good to meet you all, and hopefully we can have a very good discussions today. Thank you, Pak Erwin. Um, we could not see you. <laughs> Okay, so um, before we start with the uh, uh, the program, so refer the program to Maya again. Oh, sorry, my fault. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, sorry. So this is my time to... <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, give you a um, review of the random today. So... Um, we are going to have presentation from Shelly on uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. You will see the virtual tour of the aquarium. And then, um, and then I will give, after, after the presentation, I will give a brief summary in Bahasa Indonesia uh, to let you get the points of presentation. And then we are going break out to have a breakout group uh, you also break into uh, two or three groups to discuss the questions that we are going to provide and then one of you one of the member of the group will present it to the panel um, me and Pa Erwin and pa Shelly also will uh, become the facilitator to each group and um, and then we are going to have a Q and A session after the uh, group uh, breakout group. Uh, we will give um, we will give to we will give questions to be presented uh, to Shelley. And another one question can be um, uh, verbally uh, asked to Shelly. And then we are going to uh, have a closing of the whole program. So uh, that's what we are going to have for the whole one and a half hours. Uh, so I will uh, offer Shelly to start the presentation. Okay, <laughs> we'll start with the first slide. Thank you. All right, well again, um, welcome to our presentation today. We have two programs that we're going to be running this week and next. Uh, today is going to be focused mainly on the introducing the aquarium itself. And I'm going to show you some of the main exhibits and the species that we have um, that you would see walking through the aquarium if you were there to visit. And next week, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the science side of fisheries and aquaculture. And um, so hopefully we'll be able to see all of you at both presentations. And um, if not, just happy to have you here tonight. So go ahead and jump to the next slide. Thank you. All right. So just to start off, so we can kind of get an idea of where we are compared to each other. Um, I believe one of the questions to start the evening was where is the Monterey Bay Aquarium? And I'm kind of giving it away. Um, right here on the West Coast in California, you can follow that blue line all the way over to Jakarta, Indonesia. And if you can look really closely, that little box in the middle says that it would take about one day and two extra hours for us to reach each other by, by plane. So there's a lot of ocean that is between us, but what is 
so cool in my mind is thinking about all of the things that are swimming around underneath the water that connect us. And that's kind of what we're gonna to touch on today. You can go ahead and move to the next slide. Here we have the Monterey Bay. Um, I just wanted to introduce you to what it looked like um, in the natural setting. And then we're gonna walk inside the aquarium itself. Um, you can see there's fishing activities that go on and there are the massive waves that you see surfers on. It's a great area to recreate and also um, to some degree used for commercial resources, which we're gonna touch on um, in a little bit as well. So you can go ahead and show the first video if you wanna start that. So this is a drone and it's just gonna take you up above the building of the aquarium and you'll be able to kind of see the building from high above the Monterey Bay. So the aquarium was originally a sardine cannery. And so I mentioned that this was a, an area that was used for fishing and sardines were brought into the cannery and they were processed and canned for con human consumption. Um, now it's a building where we house various species that you can find right in our backyard, which you can see opening up out of the aquarium here. That's the Monterey Bay out in front of you. And uh, we can bring everything that's underneath that water surface into the building so that you can actually see it with your own eyes. Um, so when our visitors come in, they can look into the exhibits, they can connect with the animals that are naturally out there in the bay, learn a little bit about them, and hopefully be inspired to protect them. A lot of the different animals that you might see in the Monterey Bay, um, it is a protected area, similar to uh, maybe the Coral Triangle in uh, Indonesian waters whales and seals and otters. There are hundreds of different species of fish. We have crabs and, and uh, sea stars, such a diverse array of species. And um, just very fortunate to have all of this right in our backyard. Can you go ahead and move to the next slide? So I wanted to jump into this exhibit first because it literally is connected to the Monterey Bay, which you just saw on that last drone video. We have pipes that actually pump out or from the Monterey Bay pump water into this exhibit. Every minute, 5,500 liters of water from the bay is pumped into this exhibit. And so it's bringing in natural plankton, natural algae, and really creating a very natural habitat for all of the species that we have within this exhibit. So, you can go ahead and play the first video for this slide. And what you're gonna see are some of the animals up close swimming through the exhibit and it will take you outside of the aquarium so that you can see how well it mimics what's in the bay right in our exhibit. So we've got some rockfish swimming around the kelp here some crabs wandering around, sea stars. And as I mentioned, just hundreds of species of fish. These kelp, these tall kelp forested areas offer perfect habitat for all of these animals to find protection and food. You can see a seabird there, a cormorant swimming around. And you can see that canopy looking straight up. That's the surface of the water. So if you're looking at the surface, you see brown patches kind of laying on top of that surface. And then all of these tall kelp vines are anchored down at the bottom of the floor. And then there's the Monterey Bay Aquarium once again, peeking out of the surface of the water. So very diverse habitat here. Um, when you go into this kelp forest, we've got some otters there. <laughs> when you go into this habitat, you can- So the kelp forest feeding happens oh. twice a day. We jump into the water, all geared up to feed all the fish some delicious, sustainable seafood. I'm the pizza delivery guy. I show up, the fish know it's feeding time. 
Here I'm just going to try to feed these sharks. You can hear the gasp of the crowd outside. They can't believe that you just had your fingers that close to the leopard shark. But my experience with them is that they're like little puppy dogs. What we often hear is that leopard sharks and other sharks have this really bad reputation. Excuse you! That is just so rude! There are a lot of different personalities in this exhibit. When the giant sea bass opens up its mouth, sucks in that shrimp, it's like sinking a three-pointer from halfway across the court, just throwing it up in the air, everyone's watching it go, and the crowd goes wild. There are a lot of advantages of getting into the exhibit to feed the fish. I can check up on the animals, see how they're doing, and especially I know which animals are eating which food. Hand feeding the fish, make sure that everyone gets a slice of the pizza. It looks like the big male sheephead here is interested in grabbing a bite. Uh, do you folks all see the fish Patrick is mentioning? It's a big black fish with an orange stripe. Right now it's right below him. What do you think, buddy? There oh, you go. There go. All right. Awesome. My favorite part about working at the aquarium is seeing people make a connection with the ocean that they didn't have before. The kelp forest is a hidden treasure beneath the waves. There is this incredible world that people just, you wouldn't think is there. When we see the canopy of the kelp forest from the beach, it just looks like some brown algae is floating out there. But once you go underneath that canopy, you see hundreds of species of fish, invertebrate, algae, and then all the seals and sea lions and dolphins that are feeding on those animals. So when you come to the aquarium, it's like being at the visitor center for that kelp forest outside. I can see that sparkle in the kids' eyes, realizing that there's a whole other world that they can explore, and it's just really an amazing moment to be able to put on a show, to see connections being made with that next generation of ocean stewards sitting in the front row, staring up at you. That's the moment that really makes all of the work that goes into the feeding show completely worth it. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So what you just saw was one of our aquarium divers go into the tank and that's how they feed all of these animals in the kelp forest. He brings a bucket into the water and immediately all of the fish can smell that seafood. If you've ever been to the market and, and there's been seafood out, I'm sure you know that it's pretty smelly. And so all of the fish say dinner time and they will swim right over and take a bite and whatever they can get from the diver handing them food. And like the diver was saying, it's a great way to make sure that the fish stay healthy because you can get a close look and see how those fish are doing. Uh, typically they're eating things like squid and prawns and cut up fish, um, sometimes some uh, clams. And so it's just, again, it's a great way to make sure everybody gets a bite to eat. And it allows for our visitors to see all the different species in this exhibit front and center um, and interact with the diver so that they can learn a little bit about them. So the species that you're looking at on this slide is our giant sea bass. And this is a really important species in this exhibit. It's uh, a critically endangered species. And it is one of the large, it is the largest species in the entire kelp forest exhibit. This one that we have is considered a teenager. So he's still not done growing and he's about 45 kilograms. So he's a pretty big fish. Um, and the interesting thing, the really cool thing about this particular species is that they are one of the reasons that the Monterey Bay was determined a marine protected area. And that really limits the types of interactions that people can come and use this particular waterway for. And so fishing is limited, uh, recreation to some degree is limited. So it just makes sure that the area is protected. So species like this giant sea bass don't go extinct and disappear forever. So we wanna keep them around for, for years and years to come. Next slide. These are some of the species that you might've seen in the video. It's a little hard to tell when you have so many species swimming up and trying to get food. Um, but on the top left, you see a copper rock fish. To the right, there's a leopard shark and right in the middle is the sheephead. And they did mention, I believe, these uh, different species in the videos. Oh, I get to see some of your faces. I'm so excited. <laughs> um, thanks for turning your videos on. Uh, so I want you to think for just a second about feeding these particular animals and what you know about them already. Think for just a minute, which one do you think 
would give the diver the biggest challenge in terms of feeding? Do you think it's the rockfish or maybe the leopard shark or the sheephead, the one in the middle? It's definitely the sheephead. That's kind of a surprise. I think a lot of people naturally gravitate to the shark uh, just because they have a reputation, right? But the sheephead has, a, has an adaptation, which is something that helps it survive. All animals and plants have adaptations and they're either body parts or behaviors that are gonna help them survive in the wild. The sheephead has a very strong jaw and very big teeth that help them crunch into the foods that they eat naturally in the wild. Things like crab and urchin and maybe clams. And so they have to be able, they have to crunch those shells to get to the good stuff on the inside. So imagine being a diver and taking a piece of food and putting that towards that mouth of the sheep head. You have to be very careful you don't get your fingers in his mouth, right? <laughs> so moving on, we'll go to the next slide. So another really cool species that you might have noticed swimming around in this exhibit are our anchovies. So the anchovies are a type of forage fish. They're very small fish and they school. So schooling is actually another behavioral adaptation. So instead of that body part adaptation, it's a behavioral adaptation. And what that does, think about for a minute why it might help a lot of small fish swimming together in a tight formation. And the reason is because it offers protection. If there's a big fish coming by and they see a bunch of small fish swimming together, they might think, oh, that, that's, that's a really big animal over there. I don't wanna go over and try and eat it, right? And uh, so they might swim away and it's a way for the anchovies to protect themselves. And now in terms of a body part, that's an adaptation that helps them to swim in this formation, if you've ever looked at a fish and seen a little line along the side of their body, it's called a lateral line. And there are all these little pores along that line that sense vibrations and movements in the water. And so when all of these fish are swimming next to each other, they can feel each other's movement. So if one turns to the left, a fish next to it is gonna notice that change in the water movement and the vibrations and they're gonna be able to follow along. And this is how they're able to swim together and turn together and stay together. And it's really beautiful to watch. So I feel very fortunate that we are able to have them in our exhibit for people to come and experience. Can you go to the next slide? So this habitat would not be as spectacular and diverse as it is without the kelp, the giant kelp that grow from the seafloor up to the surface of the water. So you can see the bulbs on the left-hand side. They're filled with gas and they help the, the tall stalks to float to the surface of the uh, ocean where the fronds or the leaves can sit up towards that light and they can photosynthesize so they can make their own food, right? That's how plants find their food. So that's another type of adaptation. And everything below the canopy of the top of those palm, or not palm, the top of those uh, kelp fronds offers again habitat and food for all the different species that you're going to find throughout the kelp forest. All right, next slide. So this might be a familiar face. Um, everybody seems to love the otters, they're very cute and very furry. Um, and we do have a couple of videos of the otters. So let's go ahead and maybe play the first video and you guys will get to see them moving around. So this is the California sea otter. Very playful, the type of marine mammal. They spend the majority of their life in the salt water. And that's the exhibit right in the aquarium. All of the otters that we have on exhibit were rescues, which means that they were either injured or abandoned in the wild and they come to the aquarium in order to get better and heal and hopefully rehabilitate to the point that they're able to be released. And they're just fun to watch. <laughs>
So the next video that we're going to watch actually shows a little bit of the training that our aquarist or the people that take care of the animals at the aquarium do in order to make sure that the, uh, the otters are well taken care of. Hi girls, come on up. My favorite part about this job has to be the interactions that I get with these animals. There you go, Gidget and Abby, you get that one. I think the thing that surprises me most about the otters is how smart they really are. All the otters that we have on exhibit are all here because they're rescued animals. They used to be out in the wild at some points in their lives, um, but for whatever reason, they weren't surviving. So we brought them here and now we're kind of giving them that second chance at life. Sea otters out in the wild will eat shrimp, squid, clams, um, crabs, mussels, but we have these pretty windows down there. And so instead of giving them that hard crab that they'll go and smash against the window, we give them a little enrichment item where they still have to figure out how to get that food out of there like they would a crab, but instead of having the shell that they'll scratch the windows with, they can use that toy and kind of manipulate it to get the food out. We have a lot of enrichment items. We have an entire uh, shed full of stuff from big kiddie pools to small little enrichment items. And we have an enrichment calendar and each day we have something different written on it. So in a month, we'll do 30 different things on the 30 different days. We also have our own ice machine up here, which is one thing that they really love is munching on ice as well. <laughs> That's kind of the point of enrichment, it's enhancing their lives. So it's not just something that keeps them entertained and is fun for them, it also is something that would exhibit their natural behavior as well. As I said, they're very, very smart and they very much impress us with how quickly they can figure stuff out. We'll give them these enrichments that'll take us 20 minutes to put together and within a few minutes they have it all disassembled, all the knots are untied and they've gotten all the food out. Even if it takes a little while, which is actually, you know, kind of our goal too, the longer the better because then it's more that they're kind of working, they pretty much always end up figuring out how to get the food out. And then the next time we give it to them, they're like, oh, we figured it out already. So we always have to try to change it up as much as possible. So a couple of things that the Aquarius said that were really important were words like enrichment. And enrichment is something that we want to give all of the animals who live within the aquarium. It's something that's gonna keep them stimulated and challenge their minds, just like we like to be challenged. And uh, it also, again, mimics things that they would normally be doing out in their natural habitat. And one of the coolest things that I think we do for our otters is we will create ice blocks with their food inside the ice blocks. And so like the aquarist was mentioning, sometimes they use items like rocks to break their food open in the wild. They can break into these ice blocks and get the snacks out um, and they have to work for it. It's not just an, an easy, uh, easy shrimp that somebody's gonna hand them. Uh, they also, another thing that I think is really important to point out about the otters is that they are very particular. So right now, think about if you have a favorite food. Anybody, uh, well, if you, you can just think about if you have a favorite food. <laughs> I guess we can't, we can't talk right now. Um, but the otters also have favorite foods. And the Aquarius was mentioning that we give them prawns and clams and cut up fish and, uh, and squid. And some otters might prefer squid while others prefer shrimp. And so they all have their particular favorite foods, which is just kind of fun. You can move on to the next slide. And this is just a really cute photo of one of the little nooks and crannies where all the otters sometimes like to hang out. So I wanted to share that with you guys. And then the final slide with the otters here. There we go. So this is a really important section. Um, there's a lot that goes on. I mentioned that all of the otters that we have on exhibit are rescues. And this little pup is a really important part of a program that we have here at the aquarium, where if we find an abandoned or injured baby otter, they'll come into the aquarium. We're very careful so that they never actually see a human, but the otters that we have on exhibit, the adult females will actually come and interact with the babies and they will help teach them how to become adult otters so that they have survival skills in the wild. And it's such a crucial part of this rescue and rehabilitation program. And so the next video really outlines, it's a little bit longer than some of the other videos, but I think it does a really good job of outlining the program and how important it is to their survival. So if we could go ahead and jump into that video. All the skills she needs to succeed in her important role. Mm -hmm. 
after spending Sea otters are the delightful and charming superstars of Monterey Bay. They're also a threatened species with an uncertain future. Today, there are only 3,000 sea otters left in California. Our researchers at the Monterey Bay Aquarium monitor this fragile population closely. We are working to understand how we can help the population recover. Life is tough for a sea otter, and especially for sea otter pups. They are completely dependent on their mothers. And when a big storm rolls in, crashing waves and strong currents can separate a sea otter mom from her pup. This stranded pup is just a few days old. Without her mom, she will not be able to survive on her own. That's where the Monterey Bay Aquarium Sea Otter Program steps in. You got it? Our team of staff and volunteers respond to calls of stranded sea otters that come ashore along the California coast. When we find a stranded sea otter pup, the first thing we do is try to reunite it with its mother. If we can't find her, we take the pup back to the aquarium for further care. The first stop on our pup's journey is to Dr. Mike for a checkup. How are you doing, huh? Go bite the nice doctor. Once he gives her the all clear, the rescued pup heads behind the scenes for rehabilitation. Raising a sea otter pup is a round-the-clock job. Every few hours, we give the pup a special formula that mimics mother's milk. And when we're not giving her milk, we're grooming and grooming and grooming. A sea otter mom will spend hours every day grooming her pup. So we do the same. All that fur makes a sea otter pup float like a cork. Sea otter pups can't, so we tow her around, flip her over, and encourage her to dive, just like mom would do in the wild. We also give her a few toys to chew on. This helps build the jaw strength and coordination needed to eat solid food. When we care for pups, we put on a special outfit. The dark face shield and loose black poncho disguise our staff so the sea otter pup doesn't bond with humans. Stranded sea otters are wild animals, and we want them to stay wild. It's been nearly two months of intensive care since our stranded pup was first rescued. It's time for our resident otters to step in. A sea otter mom will spend almost a year with her pup, teaching all the skills needed to be a wild otter. The Monterey Bay Aquarium pioneered the first ever otter surrogacy program, pairing our resident otters with stranded pups to provide maternal care. After a little time getting to know each other, the pup surrogate mom is ready to get to work. Mom teaches her pup how to handle live prey how to find food buried in the sand, and how to crack open shells. And when aquarium visitors head home for the day, we move the pup into the sea otter exhibit, where she can practice deep diving and foraging in cracks and crevices for food. In the wild, sea otters play a big role in keeping the ocean healthy. They are gardeners of the kelp forest and other important coastal habitats. It's essential that our rescued pup learn all the skills she needs to succeed in her important role. After spending months with her surrogate mom, our stranded sea otter is ready for release back into the wild. For over 30 years, the Monterey Bay Aquarium has worked to rescue and rehabilitate stranded sea otter pups along the California coast. program is beginning to have some significant impacts. In Elkhorn Slough, a wetland in Monterey Bay, over half the otters are direct descendants of the Aquarium Sea Otter Program. They are transforming the slough into a healthy and thriving habitat. And maybe one day, 
The same success story will happen in other coastal habitats where otters have not been for hundreds of years. None of this work would be possible without your support. Please join us as we work to save California's sea otters. So that gave you a little taste of the otter rescue program that um, we have here at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And again, it's just a pretty incredible thing seeing a pup come in from the wild who would not have otherwise survived. And then to the point where it's released and hopefully we'll live a healthy, happy life out in, out in the Monterey Bay. Uh, all right, so next slide, we're gonna continue on here. So this is a fun little crustacean. Uh, this is something that you would find in the coral reefs and rocky reef areas uh, in the waters right off of your coast and uh, different species, but they would look pretty similar. This is a California spiny lobster and you can see all of those long antenna and feelers that they have coming out of the front of their head. Um, so you're looking right at the face of the animal here. And they use those little feelers to kind of sense their environment, kind of like you would use your fingertips to touch something and realize that it's hot or cold or, um, or just feel the wind blowing. So they can, they can kind of sense their environment with those feelers. This particular lobster is uh, about five kilograms and they think of around 11 years old. And he is one that's on exhibit at the aquarium. One of the cool adaptations of lobsters is how they grow. And this goes for crab and, and all sorts of crustaceans. Uh, but when they start to grow too big for their shell, their old shell will actually break open. Their body comes outside of that shell and everything underneath is super soft and vulnerable. And so they have to find a safe space to kind of hang out for a little while while that new shell, everything on the outside, that soft body hardens into their new shell. And that's what allows them to grow. Uh, another cool adaptation, if you wanna to move to the next slide, is looking at this really awesome, you get to see the other end of the lobster here, uh, that really awesome tail and it's all fanned out. And so you see the legs that come out of the front of the lobster and that's how they walk moving forward, but they swim in a backwards direction. And so what they'll do is they'll flip that tail underneath them, propelling the water and pushing them back. So it's a great way to escape predators or just kind of move around if they want to you know, do a little more than walk. And the, the animals that you're seeing at the bottom of that picture, uh, those are California moray eels. So a lot of these animals cohabitate together. All right, so you can go ahead and move to the next slide. This is gonna take us to our final exhibit that I wanna talk to you guys about today. Um, this is, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this particular animal. It's a type of sea turtle. Um, another charismatic species of the sea. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to highlight our open seas exhibit is because when I first uh, started this presentation and showed that great big blue ocean between the two of us, this is what connects us. All of the species that are out here in the great open seas, they migrate all over the ocean. And I just think it's such a cool way to find a connection with people that are in such a far distance from each other. Um, and an excellent example of why we need to protect all of these species together. Um, this particular species of sea turtle that we have in our open seas exhibit is a green sea turtle. And uh, it's one of six sea turtle species that you find in Indonesian coasts. Uh, so you definitely would see this species um, at home as well. And it is a, a plant eater. So they have a very sharp beak that allows them to cut into seagrasses and things of that other vegetation. That's what they're gonna be, be feeding on in the wild. Uh, another really cool adaptation of sea turtles, and this goes for a lot of marine animals, is the way that they're colored. So if you look at the top of their shell, it's generally a little bit darker of a color than the belly of their, sh of their shell. Um, so this is something called counter shading. And what it does is it offers camouflage. Think about these, these animals, these turtles or fish or sharks swimming in the open ocean. And say you have a sea turtle and a shark is swimming underneath that sea turtle, a potential predator, right? And that shark might look up 
and he's going to see a light belly on a sea turtle and it's going to blend in with the light reflecting off the surface of the water. And on the other side of that, if you had a shark swimming on top of the turtle and look down, then the shark would see a dark surface and it would start to blend in with those darker depths of the ocean. And so it really does help the turtle to protect itself in camouflage or blend in to that open ocean setting. Um, so it's a, a really, really cool adaptation. Um, you can go ahead and move on to the next slide. So these are some of the other species that you would see in this open ocean exhibit. Um, I'll walk through them. You can start the first video if you'd like to. It's of our ocean sunfish. So the species that you see in the top left-hand corner, it's a very unique looking species. Here we go. Now you can see it moving around. And so there aren't too many fish that look like this one. <laughs> he's, a, he's a really, really interesting fish. Um, those long flippers on the top and bottom and, and they stand up right in the water and they're just very slow and graceful. Um, beautiful to watch. The reason I wanted to point out how slow they are is gonna come into play in just a few minutes when we watch a video on how we feed the different animals in this particular exhibit. And so you can keep watching the, the mola, but if you look at the next photo to the right of that uh, ocean sunfish or mola mola, um, you see a very streamlined looking fish with a forked tail. And that is a, a dolphin fish or mahi-mahi. Um, they might also call them dorado. Uh, that's a very fast streamlined fish and the shape of its body is what allows it to move so streamlined through the water. So it moves a lot faster than this mola mola or the ocean sunfish. So the next video is going to highlight the third photo in the left lower corner of this slide, and that's a pelagic ray. And you guys have probably seen rays in pictures or maybe even out in the wild if you snorkel or swim or dive. They're pretty majestic animals. And we can go ahead and play the next video. There we go. You can see them just gliding through the water. Now their mouth is on the underside of their body similar to the leopard shark that we saw in the kelp forest exhibit. And they'll eat animals that are on the bottom of the ocean, just kind of moving along and slurp them in. And they've got a, a crushing jaw as well to crunch into shells of different animals that they might find on the, the surface of the ocean floor. So again, just very slow moving and graceful and quite large being in the open ocean. And so moving to that final picture that you can't see very well, but you'll be able to see it in a minute. Um, more than likely you've seen this, this species before. It's a hammerhead shark. And we do have sharks in this exhibit as well. And they all cohabitate just like they would out in the wild. Um, so another species that you might see in common in all four of these photos is our Pacific sardines. And very similar to the anchovies in the kelp forest, they are a four type species that school and swim together in large groups uh, so that they look much bigger than they actually are. Um, but they are absolutely phenomenal to watch if you ever have the opportunity. And actually in this next video, I believe you'll be able to see some of that. So, but not the next one, we have one more in between. You can move to the next slide. The last species I want to mention in this exhibit um, is our tuna species. We have bluefin tuna and yellowfin tuna. They're very similar in look. Um, tuna in general, I wanted to mention this species last because this is the kind of perfect segue into our Watch program. It's a flagship species um, that is a very sought after commercial fish um, to catch and bring in for us to eat. Um, if, if you like fish, more than likely you've probably had tuna fish in your life. Um, so very popular on, on menus. Uh, but this is a very fast, majestic top predator out in the open ocean. And again, the size and the speed um, and, and just the power of these fish, all of this comes into play when we're taking care of these animals. Let's go ahead and show the video for this slide. You can kind of see them moving through the water. Very sleek. Not seeing top speeds right here, but oh, and you can see those uh, Pacific sardines moving. It's like a beautiful dance just looking into this exhibit, watching all of the fish swim together.
Again, you can see that forked tail and that streamlined body that really helps it dart through the water. So moving on to this final slide for the Open Seas exhibit. I wanted to just show all of the different species in one shot here. And, um, and this is the window that looks into the exhibit. And what we're gonna watch next is the, uh, a video that kind of outlines how we make sure that everybody gets fed and is taken care of appropriately. So if you wanna go ahead and pull up the next video. What she's doing there is something called broadcast feeding, just throwing food on the surface of the water. And all of the faster, larger, more powerful fish can go up to the surface of the water and grab a bite to eat. It's quite a feeding frenzy. So this is a great opportunity for those fast fish to come up and get their food. But what about those slower fish? The slower fish are actually trained to target feed. And what we do with species like the mola and the rays or the sea turtle is we train them to recognize a target that we can put into the water. For instance, with the ocean sunfish, that mola mola, we have a square piece of PVC pipe that we can dip into the water and the mola mola or the ocean sunfish recognizes that target and will swim over and, and come to the surface of the water where one of our aquarists will be waiting at the surface and they can hand feed that fish. And so they get a very specific diet and then they it just really ensures that everybody gets all the food that they need. Um, so it's, it's a layered way of making sure that all of the animals are cared for in a very dynamic setup of an exhibit. All right, so moving on to the next slide. So going back to, you saw a little bit of, of, the, of, of the exhibits that we have at the aquarium and why we have the animals that we do uh, within those exhibits and again, hopefully to build connections with our visitors and, um, and what we have out in the wild to inspire them again, just to conserve the ocean. Um, but we do have other programs. You saw a little bit about the otter rescue program earlier in the presentation. Um, the middle is kind of a, a way of showing that we do a lot of research on an array of other um, topics out in the wild. Some of them are plastic, uh, debris research, um, tuna research. Uh, we do research on great white sharks and um, climate change and how climate change is affecting the environment and the different species that are right in our Monterey Bay. Um, and then last but not least, the uh, Seafood Watch program, um, which is the program that I work for. And we focus on wild caught fisheries and aquaculture. And again, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into those topics in next week's presentation. Um, so I hope that you guys definitely come back and join us for that. But the very scrape surface of the importance of this program is making sure that we're balancing human use of these resources, bringing fish out of the ocean for our consumption and balancing that with keeping a healthy population out in the ocean. Uh, because when you're taking too many fish out, then it leaves the ocean ecosystem in an imbalanced state. And it's gonna mean that some other species aren't able to survive and thrive in their natural setting. And so um, if you wipe out one species, then that can potentially have a domino effect affecting a lot of other species in the ocean. We also have to be very mindful of our aquaculture practices because while some of them may be away from water, everything that, that goes into an aquaculture system, we have to think about how it might affect the environment surrounding it and ultimately leading back to the ocean. And so again, um, we're gonna dive a little deeper into that next week. Um, but I just wanted to touch on it because this is an extension of what the aquarium does outside of um, exhibit the, the Monterey Bay and all of the animals that we have there. So if you want to move to the next slide. So there are also an array of educational opportunities for students. Um, you can see here that there are a bunch of students coming up to this is our touch tank um, where they can actually touch and feel a lot of the different types of animals 
might be at in the grocery store in, in the, reef area, the rocky reef areas of, um, of the coastline. And hopefully we will get back to this point someday. Um, you can move to the next slide. Right now we're in a very digital phase, as you guys are all aware. Um, we have teen programs that are specifically made for teens that are accessible online. Um, we also have programs for school groups, um, K through 12 uh, school groups, where you can download activities and courses and actually speak with an educator from the aquarium and um, work through similar activities that they would do if they were actually coming to visit the aquarium. Uh, you can move to the next slide. And then this again is just an example of some of those uh, activities and programs that our education department would engage with students um, when we were able to interact in person. And so very uh, hands-on, and uh, you know, various uh, technical or, or discovery lab type programs, getting out into the wild, actually touching and feeling and being in nature. Um, hopefully, again, we'll get back to that sooner than later. Um, down in that right-hand corner, I'm an example of the teacher trainings that we do. So we work with teachers as well so that they can take opportunities and information back to their classrooms. So go to the next slide. And, and there we are. So uh, this is our, our giant Pacific octopus to uh, say thank you for, for listening and um, I welcome any questions that you have. Thanks, Shelly. So this is very interesting. Teman-teman uh, mungkin tadi sudah lihat presentasi Shelly. Um, menarik sekali ya. Tadi saya juga sempat menuliskan di chat box, uh, minta teman-teman untuk uh, perhatikan baik-baik presentasi Shelly. Sorry Shelly, I have to uh, briefly summarize your presentation in Bahasa Indonesia. Um, jadi tadi dalam presentasi Shelly itu ada beberapa hint atau clue atau uh, petunjuk yang bisa dipakai uh, oleh teman-teman untuk nanti berdiskusi pada uh, um, Oke, okay. sebelum saya uh, kasih uh, brief summary dari presentasi Shelly tadi, uh, saya pengen tanya dulu, ini teman-teman kebanyakan yang bergabung ini dari mana? Uh, daerah mana? Ada yang bisa unmute? Unmute yourself. Where are you from? From. Hello. Yeah. From. Bisa dengar Sarsa, Bu. Ya, Ibu. Dari mana, Bu? Oh ya, uh, perkenalkan. Bahasa bahasa Indonesia atau bahasa Inggris? Bahasa Indonesia boleh. Bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> Terima kasih, Bu. Perkenalkan nama saya Devina. Uh, saya dosen dari Lautan, Universitas Brawijaya. Universitas Brawijaya. Jadi, kebetulan is beberapa... Java. Ya, is Java. Brawijaya University. Uh, so, kebetulan okay. beberapa mahasiswa yang hadir di sini adalah mahasiswa kami yang tergabung dalam mata kuliah pengantar usia kabar. Oh, cool. Ya, yeah. so uh, we have students from Brawijaya University here. Um, yeah, and Ibu Defriona is uh, one of the lecturers. Gitu ya, Bu, ya. Terima kasih, yeah. Ibu Defri. Ada lagi yang dari, mungkin ada yang dari Sumatera? Ada yang dari Sulawesi? Tadi saya lihat yang paling serius itu Catherine Nur. Halo Catherine Nur. Bisa di-unmute. Hai Ibu. Hai Catherine dari mana? Saya dari Jakarta Bu. Oh Jakarta. Dari? Dari Jakarta Timur. Uh, uh, sekolahnya atau 
kuliah mahasiswa oh, dari mahasiswa Brawijaya muridnya Ibu Devina oh oke okay. oh <laughs> Catherine is also from Brawijaya University uh, but he is now in Jakarta ada yang dari Sulawesi Tengah tidak ada ada yang dari Sumatera tidak ada juga Oke, okay, terima kasih. Uh, sekali lagi saya juga mau ingatkan bahwa teman-teman dan juga uh, kalau ada guru atau dosen di sini yang mau melempar pertanyaan bisa diketik di chat box. Boleh dari Indonesia, any questions you can type in bahasa Indonesia. Uh, we can help to translate it into English. Shelly will uh, give a comments on it. Uh, saya akan sedikit mereview apa yang Presentasikan oleh uh, Shelly. Tadi Shelly sudah sedikit menjelaskan tentang uh, Montreby Aquarium, bagaimana tampilannya dari dalam, dari luar, uh, bahwa uh, akuarium ini host uh, berbagai mamalia laut, berbagai jenis ikan, ya, ada uh, ikan karang, ikan laut dalam, kemudian juga ada super uh, burung laut, ada invertebrata uh, dan lain. In, ada juga alga tadi ada kelp forest ya terlihat uh, juga dijelaskan bahwa uh, ada otters ya itu otters yang ada di sana adalah otters yang ditemukan dalam kondisi uh, luka atau abandon di uh, di luar kemudian dirawat dijaga uh, pada waktu tertentu di mana mereka sudah siap untuk dilepas ke alam maka mereka akan dilepas ke alam liar. Tadi diceritakan bagaimana uh, bayi otter itu ya dirawat oleh uh, mama otter yang lain ya, bukan oleh mama kandungnya ya, oleh mama otter yang lain. Kemudian juga tadi kelp, kelp itu uh, ada dia punya gelembung-gelembung uh, udara, itu fungsinya untuk membuat si uh, tegakan kelpnya itu jadi uh, tegak ke atas sehingga mereka memang uh, tujuannya mencapai permukaan air untuk mendapat lebih banyak oksigen. Kemudian juga tadi ada si turtle ya, bagaimana si turtle itu dia me, 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 apa, e, punya strategi kamuflase ya. Jadi di bagian punggungnya ini warnanya gelap, bagian perutnya ini warnanya terang karena di bagian punggungnya itu gelap e, dengan e, catatan kalau ada predator di bagian atas, nanti predator ngelihat ke bawah kok kayaknya gelap gitu ya. Menyamar menyamar seperti dasar laut. Sementara kalau predatornya di bawah perut, ketika melihat ke atas, maka e, terlihatnya terang seperti pantulan cahaya matahari gitu ya. Jadi itu kayak kamuflase. Cara-cara hewan untuk e, untuk bertahan e, hidup di e, al alam. Kemudian juga beberapa perilaku hewan termasuk misalnya tadi ada mola-mola yang berenangnya lambat gitu ya termasuk cara mereka makan juga terus pada saat akuaris memberi makan itu juga tergantung dari perilaku si hewan tersebut kemudian tadi juga dijelaskan tentang program seafood watch itu di bawahnya Monterey Bay Aquarium program seafood watch ini pada dasarnya adalah melakukan konservasi Hingga saat ini kami masih bekerja untuk konservasi ikan tangkap di laut yang ditangkap langsung dan juga akuakultur atau budidaya. Kami juga melakukan beberapa riset baik terkait hiu, plastik, perubahan iklim, dan juga tuna, ya, perikanan tuna. Kita melakukan di berbagai negara. Uh, tapi pada dasarnya visinya adalah bagaimana menjaga keseimbangan uh, laut. Uh, kemudian um, Monterey Bay Aquarium juga punya program-program untuk pendidikan, baik untuk uh, pelajar, untuk guru-guru, juga untuk uh, teenagers, untuk um, uh, remaja. Ya tadi terlihat. Oke, okay, so um, ini uh, brief summary. Dari presentasi Shelly, setelah ini kita akan masuk ke breakout group. Jadi saya lihat uh, ini jumlahnya ada sekitar 70-an. Kita akan masuk ke tiga grup. 
masing-masing grup nanti akan menjawab e, pertanyaan satu pertanyaan jadi akan didiskusikan pertanyaan tersebut saya Pak Erwin dan Shelly e, akan membantu memfasilitasi masing-masing grup e, me Pak Erwin and Shelly will facilitate the group discussion we are going to please listen to this question ya yeah. so group one will discuss on question number one the question is Why marine resources have to be sustainable? Why marine resources have to be sustainable? Give an example. Yeah. Marine resources means animals, kelp forest, etc. Group number two. What should we do to make sure that the marine resources are sustainable? What should we do? To make sure the marine resources are sustainable. Give an example. That's question number two. Question number three. What marine animals from the previous presentations was also found in Indonesia? What marine animals from the previous presentation was also found in Indonesia? And give some examples. Okay, so we are now going to break out group. Uh, Pak Erwin will facilitate group number one. I will facilitate group number two. And Shelly will facilitate group number three. Is it good? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if we were <laughs> ready to go or not. Okay. Um, so welcome everyone to breakout group number three. Um, I, I don't see a lot of uh, videos on right now and that's perfectly fine. Um, I, if you would like to join via video, I would love to, to see everybody. Um, what we are going to be discussing are the types of marine animals in the presentation that um, you can see in your waters as well. And um, I'd also just like to hear about the different types of animals that you've encountered, um, your explorations uh, along the, the coastline. So if anyone wants to jump in. see. I need to, oh, there we go. Anyone? Okay, Didi, um, Shelly, allow me to translate a bit for you. Jadi, teman-teman uh, boleh share di Indonesia itu apa saja yang bisa ditemukan, uh, apa namanya, hewan-hewan uh, lautnya. Bu Devri mungkin mau membantu menjawab. Terima kasih. Ini dengan Mbak siapa? Ini Mbak. Kenapa Bu? Ini dengan Mbak siapa ya? Dengan Mbak Nadia. Jadi aku akan membantu Shelly. Jadi Ibu boleh menjawab dalam bahasa Indonesia. Nanti akan aku sampaikan ke Shelly dalam bahasa Inggris. Oke. Mbak Nadia. Hai Shelly. Nice to, huh? meet you. nice to meet you. It's a really good presentation. I really enjoy it. I feel like uh, you're really taking us to the real aquarium. It's really nice. Like, um, and we mostly are uh, my students here. I hope they understand. And then, it's like normally in class, we always have discussion, we ask questions, and some of them will answer. Maybe I want to encourage them to say something. 
uh, regarding with the topic as well. Like a little bit brief information, we in our previous uh, lecture, we talk about the biological oceanography. And then I think some of the material in our courses are uh, regarding with the life in the ocean and then what to have explained is a really good example of our material. Then I, I remember under shading, we have it, we also have it in our material, and then you, you really explain it really well, and I hope our students understand it, like under shading, as you can see from top, it's different, and then from below, it's a really good example. And for the discussion, the student remember about the, the example of the counter shading, like the animal you use for the counter shading, uh, that's the clue for the uh, question number three, right? What, what is what what animal green animal in Monterey Bay Aquarium that we also have in Indonesia? So that's that's the first group of a student. I I hope you all remember where is the animal and you can you can say something to tell you about it and what type of animal we have similar between the Monterey Bay Aquarium in Indonesia. I can give you that one clue, but I think there are a lot of there are a lot of animals that you have uh, presented in the presentation that you also have in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. So students, just try to say something, either in Indonesia or in English. We have Mbak Nadia who will translate. Your... Mungkin boleh bu, uh, murid-muridnya dibantu menyalakan kamera nih, biar kita bisa. Coba ditunjuk, Bu. Biasanya kan lebih mudah begitu. <laughs> Oke, okay, oh, okay, semuanya kalau bisa on camera ya, mau kalau di kelas saya juga minta on camera. Tapi biasanya memang di akhir-akhir, tapi sebagian besar menyalakan. Mungkin kalau ada yang mau mengajukan diri atau mau ditunjuk, kalau tunjuk saya sudah punya kandidat. Ya. <laughs> <laughs> so, shall we to translate a bit? Um, we're encouraging everyone to turning uh, to turn on their camera, and we are waiting if there is going to be a volunteer. If not, Bu Devi here will just pick a student and force them to answer. <laughs> okay, any volunteers? Oh, uh, I'll go. <laughs> okay. Hi, um, I'm actually from the uh, East Coast of uh, the United States. <laughs> um, so th from the uh, species that you uh, mentioned, there, there weren't many that um, live in the Atlantic Ocean. But um, um, I think from what I've seen, I think um, there's definitely a lot of uh, Atlantic croaker and um, mm -hmm. silver sides and um, I think if you go in the bay, there's um, uh, horseshoe crabs and like um, killifish and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'm I'm also from the East Coast, so I grew up with a lot of those animals as well. <laughs> Thank you for for jumping in. Anyone else? All answers are good answers. Mungkin Jopan, Jopan, ayo Jopan. Yeah. Uh, maaf, uh, saya bisa menjawab dengan ya. Uh, uh, kan uh, yang kita ketahui memang uh, Indonesia itu banyak banget uh, apa perairannya. Jadi kayak memang biota laut Indonesia itu banyak. Jadi kayak uh, apa? Jadi hewan-hewan di Indonesia pun bermacam. Kan. Jadi kayak bisa itu kita laut di Indonesia itu kayak uh, yang kita temukan itu kayak ada buyu, ada lumba lumba, atau uh, apa hiu paus itu yang biasa kita temukan di Indonesia begitu. Apa nggak penyu? Gitu. So he mentioned um, shark whale. Oh, the whale shark. Oh uh, yeah, whale shark. Mm -hmm. yep. And um, I'm pretty sure um, 
I don't know the English word for the other fish. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's cool though that that uh, you're experiencing these different species. I think that's the most important part: being able to just you know get out there and see them and appreciate them, and um, and ultimately again, that's what leads to wanting to protect them, right? So good job. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. To maybe answer or add to that. Jadi hewan yang ada di presentasi tadi itu, uh, contohnya ada penyu hijau. Karena di Indonesia juga terdapat penyu hijau. Seperti itu, Kak. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. So... Other one was the green sea turtle. Yep. That's right. That's the one that, that we have and you guys have, which is really cool. There was another one that I said in the presentation um, that we have here in California, and you all have one that's similar, um, but a different species. Do you guys remember what that one was? Get all the legs. Is it one? What was that? Bluefin tuna and yellowfin tuna. Oh, the tuna, absolutely. Yep, yep. So that's one of those open sea species that does a lot of the migrations across the Pacific range. So what other, does anyone want to uh, talk about the um, any of the other questions? Uh, why it's important to uh, keep marine resources sustainable, or um, maybe some examples of um, certain resources that that's really important for them to be balanced out in the ocean. Jadi mengapa um, hewan-hewan dan uh, apa namanya flora dan fauna yang ada di lautan ini harus kita jaga uh, kelangsungan hidupnya? Dia mau menjawab? Eh hey dong, jangan malu-malu. Boleh kita tunjuk yang lain kali ya? Hmm, yang belum Itu nyalakan kamera mic. atau belum membuka mic? Yang mana nih, Bu, enaknya? <laughs> um, coba ya, ada Indah Permatasari bisa nyalakan kamera dan mic? Mungkin? Baik, Kak. Jadi menurut oh. kamu kenapa uh, bahwa apa namanya biota laut ini harus dijaga kelangkaan eh kelangsungannya? Supaya uh, kelangsungan hidup dari organisme di laut itu tidak tidak punah atau dapat terjaga dengan aman, Kak. Okay, so she said it's to prevent extinction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so next question, are there any particular marine species that you want to make sure are protected? Untuk teman-teman di sini, apakah ada uh, makhluk laut yang uh, untuk pribadi diri sendiri mau dijaga supaya nggak punah? Coba pendapat masing-masing. Maybe we can go around the room so everybody can have a say. Ya, jadi semua harus menjawab dan semua harus ngasih komentar. Coba, we'll start with Catherine. Uh, kalau saya pribadi, uh, penyu. Karena penyu itu uh, sekarang ini sudah mulai punah. Jadi uh, saya, saya pribadi ingin menjaga keberlangsungannya penyu tersebut. Sehingga... Uh, untuk generasi selanjutnya masih dapat melihat uh, keberadaan penyu tersebut. Terima kasih. So she wants the turtles to keep 
um so to keep from extinction because she wants the future generation to know uh what the turtles and uh what they look like you just made my heart sing <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay uh jovan uh, kalau dari saya sendiri sebenarnya saya pengen itu hiu uh, untuk hiu sendiri kan Uh, kebanyakan memang uh, berbahaya untuk manusia, cuman tanpa kita sadari justru manusialah yang berbahaya untuk hiu. Nah, jadi uh, kalau menurut saya yang harus jadi selamatkan itu hiu. So he said sharks, because there's a lot of misconception that sharks are dangerous to humans, but it's actually humans who are dangerous to sharks. So he wants to protect the sharks. You guys are, you have this, yes. <laughs> So, um, Chu, is that how I pronounce your name? Can I pronounce it that way? Oh, um, were you uh, calling on me or? <laughs> so, um, any marine um, animals you want to uh, keep from extinction? Um, I was gonna say sharks, but uh, someone already said. That. <laughs> but uh, second would be the. Um, Definitely the dolphin fish. I think that's a pretty cool fish. <laughs> do you do you like to eat them too? Um, I actually haven't eaten that specific species of fish, but uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's another great reason to make sure we protect them and and keep the the populations balanced out there, right? Because oh, a lot actually, of people speaking... do like eat them. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of which, I I was kind of uh... a. <laughs> Uh, what was it? Um, so, well, when you were mentioning the species at the aquarium, I was a little bit upset that you didn't mention the great white shark that uh, the aquarium used to keep. <laughs> we did used to have them in 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 uh, in the exhibit, so um, that was before my time. But I, we did. You're right, we did, um, and that's a pretty spectacular thing. So thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> Anyone else want to jump in? Bu Devi, mau menjawab? Oh, saya kena todong juga. Uh, apa itu? Semua sih, actually, like all the species that almost uh, extinct, we should conserve it. But uh, especially the one that is uh, going over fishing. Uh, but like, if this is more private answer, I will say mola mola <laughs> because they are cute. <laughs> <laughs> They're such a unique fish. <laughs> <laughs> They're very cute. Like I never seen it like in reality, so mm -hmm. I want to see it. <laughs> they're they're beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So just and just kind of move along. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Important to protect them too. <laughs> so would it be okay if I throw this question to Mr. and Mrs. Dearheart? <laughs> Mom and Dad. Yes, hello. <laughs> what species would you protect, Mom? For you, the whales. <laughs> we know you have a passion for them. <laughs> All the large whales. <laughs> I especially enjoyed your video on the baby otters. I thought that was very interesting and how it takes a year to train them to survive in the water. And I, that was fascinating. <laughs> and how you feed the, what was the name of that last fish? The moe moe or? The mola mola? Yeah, the, that you the put a, we were just talking um, about. Mm -hmm. water. Yeah, how did you train them to know that meant to come to the surface? That's, that's what the aquarists are in charge of. So <laughs> I let them do the training. <laughs> Well, Y'all do a great job. I really we've enjoyed about, it. Thank you. We've got about one minute, it looks like. If anyone has any any last species that they want to they wanna mention. No one wants to protect the smaller fishes. <laughs> Everyone oh. wanted to protect like whales and turtles and dolphins and sharks. And no one protects anyone. <laughs> the little guys are important too. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just love seeing how much uh, genuine passion you guys have for the ocean and you're already 
so far advanced. And um, I really do, I mean it when I say I see the next generation leaders um, who are going to be in, you know, taking, taking this into your hands and leading the way to protect the ocean. So thank you. Sorry, I I was muted myself. <laughs> so, how's other group? Shelly and Darwin? We need more time. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. So, we have my... some very enthusiastic uh, uh, discussion. Participation, participant, uh, give some example why we have to conserve the oceans. Yeah. Oh, wow. Food, uh, uh, ecosystem services, economy. Wow. <laughs> wow, that's so advanced. <laughs> How about you, Shelly? We had a great group. Um, we talked a lot about the different species that you would see potentially both in Indonesia and in Monterey Bay area and everything in between. And then I asked um, specifically about some experiences that they had with species that they had seen um, with their interactions. And then uh, we talked about some of the different marine life that um, they personally wanted to make sure stayed protected for years to come. So it was really, cool. really good. <laughs> cool, super cool. So um, we are, uh, do, do you already have the champion of each group? I hope. Each group has already get someone to present. Uh, Nadia, do you want to jump in for ours? Yeah, we can start with group Mas Erwin, group number one. Uh, we, we have two person just now who's been very enthusiastic, even make me almost give up. <laughs> cool. Mas Muhammad Ag, sorry. And also Sarah Mahani. Uh, perhaps you can speak up. On behalf of your group, mungkin bisa cerita Mas Muhammad Agli, Agli dan Mbak Sarah. Tadi kita cerita tentang betapa nikmatnya kalau bisa makan ikan uh, selamanya, gitu kan? And what will what will happen if the oceans there is no no fish in the ocean? Apa yang terjadi kalau laut kita tidak ada ikan lagi? <laughs> cool, super. So Can we ask Mas dan Mbak untuk present? Satu, dua menit. Silahkan. Cerita saja. Iya, uh, yeah. tadi dari kelompok kita diskusi tentang kenapa uh, ekosistem di laut itu harus tetap berjalan seperti semestinya gitu sih. Karena kalau yang dari kita diskusiin tadi, Karena dari perputaran ekosistem yang di laut itu nanti ujungnya akan kembali lagi ke manusia. Karena nantinya akan kita manfaatkan sendiri gitu. Nggak cuma untuk bahan makanan, tapi juga bisa jadi sebagai salah satunya objek dari wisata gitu. Dan beberapa dari ekosistem laut itu juga kan ada yang dilindungi. Makanya e, harus tetap kita jaga gitu sih kurang lebih. Oke, okay. satunya lagi, Mas. Mas, Mas. Ya, yeah. kalau dari saya tadi, yang saya bilang ke bawah sana nanti, at the end of the day, kita bakalan balik manusia lagi. Jadi gimana caranya supaya kita memanfaatkan, tapi gimana caranya juga kita harus mempertahankan. gitu. Karena kita kan nggak mungkin. Kalau dari bayangan saya, kalau misalkan di lautnya mati pun, akan ada kemungkinan bahwa kita akan mati juga karena kita akan kehilangan sumber daya alam seperti itu. Jadi itu kurang lebih. Oke. Terus untuk kelompok 2 ya. Mas saya malah lupa namanya. Mas siapa tadi? Saya Oke, okay. ah ya Mas Diva. 
Uh, excuse me, allow me to present the result of the discussion about the question what should we do to make sure marine resource are sustainable. But I'm sorry, I have to present this in Indonesia, in Basel. Okay. Apa sih yang harus kita lakukan untuk memastikan sumber daya laut berkelanjutan? Yang pertama adalah kita harus menghindari alat-alat tangkap ilegal. Contohnya adalah cantrang dan trawl. Cantrang dia memiliki uh, lubang yang sangat kecil dan di mana dia bisa menangkap seluruh ukuran ikan. Cantrang yang dipasang pada ukuran kapal 70 GT yang hanya segitu itu bisa mencapai panjang hingga 1,8-2 km sehingga dia bisa menutup dasar lautan yang dapat menangkap seluruh ukuran ikan. Yang kedua adalah membatasi jumlah penangkapan spesies tertentu di mana kita harus membatasi jumlah penangkapan jumlah spesies perikanan tangkap yang dianggap sudah sedikit berkurang untuk dijadikan bahan konsumsi. Kemudian yang ketiga, menghindari penangkapan ukuran ikan tertentu seperti ukuran ikan yang kecil atau baby fish. Kemudian yang keempat, kita menyangkut pautkan kepada perikanan kapal tangkap diperketat. Pada tahun 2015 terdapat peraturan Menteri Kelautan dan Perikanan yang dikeluarkan oleh Ibu Susi di mana dia melarang uh, berbagai alat tangkap, salah satunya adalah cantrang dan trawl. Namun pada menteri yang sekarang, uh, peraturan tersebut dihilangkan dan menteri kembali memperbolehkan penangkapan, eh maaf, maksud saya penggunaan kapal berukur 200 GT, di mana ukuran kapal 70 GT saja bisa membawa cantrang dengan panjang hingga 2 km. Bagaimana jika kapal yang berukuran 200 GT? Kemudian yang kelima adalah menghindari ekspor bibit, di mana seharusnya bibit itu bisa kita gunakan sebagai uh, sumber daya alam dalam negeri, di mana kita dapat memanfaatkannya di dalam negeri dan kita akan menjual hasil jadinya untuk uh, komoditas ekspor, yang di mana itu lebih menguntungkan. Uh, menurut saya seperti itu. Terima kasih. Oke, okay, makasih Mas Diva, grup 3. Somebody from Dupree. I think we is it is it Dupree? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, mungkin saya bisa bantu. Uh, I will I will say it in Indonesia is it okay? Uh, jadi hasil diskusi kami tadi pertanyaannya adalah jenis-jenis biota marine animal apa saja yang sama antara antrae bed aquarium dengan Indonesia. Mungkin di awal Sally sudah sampaikan karena ada beberapa faktor lingkungan yang sama sehingga memungkinkan biotanya itu sama. Tapi dari materi presentasi <tuh> uh, seperti green turtles, uh, kemudian ada tuna, kita juga punya tuna, kemudian ada anchovy, ikan-ikan kecil, sardin, anchovy. Itu uh, sebenarnya kalau kita berbicara uh, mungkin... Uh, kalau spesies mungkin agak sedikit berbeda, tapi kalau misalnya taksonomi yang lebih tinggi itu hampir sama, beberapa juga uh, ditemukan di sana dan beberapa juga ada di Indonesia. Kemudian seperti itu. Oke, okay. terima kasih banyak. Thank you very much. This is a very great uh, discussion. I see. Uh, everybody participate in the discussion. So uh, a little bit brief of the uh, uh, the presentation, the discussion uh, presentation of the from discussions uh, from group number one. It's uh, um, uh, in the end the ecosystem uh, giving the benefits for the people as uh, resources to uh, preserve. That's why. Uh, the uh, the uh, marine resources should uh, kept uh, sustainably, and for group number two, there are some um, uh, factors that have to be uh, kept. Uh, uh, for instance, the uh, avoiding the illegal fishing gears, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, avoiding the baby fish or seeds, 
and no export of uh, baby fees uh, and the volume uh, allowable volume of uh, fees for certain species uh, and also um, uh, the, uh, 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 regulations of the fishing fleet and the group number three uh, some uh, species at taxonomy level it uh, almost similar with uh, what we have in Indonesia, though at the species level, some are uh, different with us, but we also have the green turtles, we have the tuna, we have anchovies, we have sardines as well. So um, this is very much interesting. <laughs> uh, and uh, I can see that uh, we have uh, I think Shelly have mentioned already uh, previously that uh, we are going to have the uh, the next uh, program on 29th of December, uh, the same time, uh, uh, but uh, uh, that at that time we are going to have a more flexible time, more additional time, we are going to have two hours and we focus on the uh, fisheries itself. We are going to uh, talk focusingly on the wild capture fisheries and also the uh, aquaculture fisheries. We are going to invite another two experts to, um, to present on that uh, uh, issues. Uh, and we will also have this kind of uh, interaction discussion, interactive discussion, Hopefully, at that time, we can um, have more flexible uh, time to discuss. And our, we really hope that you all can join us again uh, uh, on, uh, on the week session. So we have a uh, our interactive uh, discussion and also the panel of this uh, group. Now we open uh, questions uh, to go directly to Shelly. If there's any question uh, on anything, <laughs> anything that's uh, related with what Shelly is present, uh, everybody can raise up your hand. Or let me check if there is a question already. No question type if here. Not, yeah. Any uh, other? I was just gonna say if um if you if there's anything that anyone wants to add, if they are um, excited or passionate about anything in particular, please feel free to take this opportunity to do that. Um I wanna I wanna hear. I know everyone else does too, so don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ada nggak yang mau tanya apa gitu terkait uh, diskusi kita hari ini terkait presentasi Shelly? Silakan. Yuk. Bisa bisa ditanya dalam bahasa Ing bahasa Indonesia. Ada. Coba nih tadi Mbak Agis, Mbak Agnis atau Mas Diva, saya hafalnya yang presentasi tadi ya. Yang presentasi tadi ada Mbak Sarah, ada Ibu Devri. Saya sudah ketik, Bu. Oh, oh sudah diketik ya? Oke, okay. let me check. So. Oh, the ticket of the uh, the ticket to the aquarium, <laughs> the price of the ticket. Do you oh. know, Shelly? Uh, I want to say it's somewhere around fifty U.S. dollars. We're we're closed right now, unfortunately, and I don't know when we're gonna open our doors. So I have no idea what might change um, from how things were pre-COVID versus when we're able to open our doors again. So. <laughs> Ya, jadi karena uh, kondisi pandemi COVID ini, Bu, um, sejak bulan Maret itu akuarium tutup. Uh, uh, makanya kita juga tadi uh, kita, 
uh, apa video-video dalam presentasi Shelly itu bukan yang live karena um, agak sedikit uh, sulit untuk bikin yang live gitu uh, khusus untuk kegiatan ini karena memang uh, masih tutup hanya orang-orang tertentu seperti akuaris yang boleh masuk untuk memberi makan hewan-hewan uh, uh, di sana gitu jadi Uh, kalau yang sebelum pandemi itu 50 dolar, sesudah pandemi kita nggak tahu, <laughs> belum tahu. Ya, ada pertanyaan lain? Bu ini? Ya, boleh. Ada yang nanya apa ikan paling mahal di dunia? Ikan paling mahal di dunia? Can you uh, can you answer that, Shelly? What's the <laughs> what's the most expensive fish in the world? Oh my goodness! <laughs> I don't know that I have that answer. I know, um, I know that the the bluefin tuna that I I heard about on sale um, that are on menus are pretty expensive. But I don't know that that's the most expensive. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, um, uh, there is an auction I think in Japan. Uh, uh, where the bluefin tuna can reach uh, all, uh, about one million, one, one million US dollars or uh, seven, uh, sorry, 700 or, or 800,000 US dollars. Kira-kira satu miliar mas waktu itu. The auction. The whole fish. The whole fish, yeah. The whole <laughs> fish. Blue, <laughs> yeah. It's is huge, yeah. Uh, I don't know, 70 kg, 70 to 80 kg, 70, 80 kilo in total. Itu ada di Indonesia, Bu? Bukan. Di, uh, Ikannya? Bukan. Itu ikan dari um, uh, apa yang sebelah barat? <laughs> Bukan dari Pasifik. Ya? Yeah? Bukan, bukan dari Indonesia, uh, Pak Erwin. Karena uh, Indonesia itu nggak punya uh, sumber da, sumber kan bluefin tuna yang cukup banyak. Jadi kalaupun ada tangkapan bluefin tuna itu biasanya jumlahnya sedikit. Ada, oh ini ada uh, yang penasaran tadi jelaskan bahwa ikan teri menggunakan Linear literalis untuk bergerak sesuai arah kawanannya. Saya penasaran bagaimana cara mereka menentukan. Oh, oke. Okay. Uh, Shelly, can you uh, explain more on the anchovy uh, swimming you know, in schooling? How can they um, moving around in the same direction? How they get with friends? The other anchovy? Sure. Um, and all fish have these lateral lines that I'm talking about. Um, it's very hard to see with your eye. You can see a very faint line along the side of the fish. Um, if you were to look, you know, very closely or under a microscope, even, you might be able to see some little pores, um, like kind of like your skin has pores. Um, or, or if you think about uh, maybe even a, a sponge, like little holes, you know, um, and, and I can't necessarily go into depths of the biology, but essentially these pores are very sensitive. So um, think about if you, if you just, for example, blow on your hand, right? But say you like step back a little bit, you don't feel it as much if you're further away. And so if a fish feels the vibrations of the movement of one fish, and that fish starts to veer off, this fish is going to pick up on that and say, oh, I want to go this way too. And so they migrate together. Does that kind of explain it a little bit better? Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, I think uh, I think it's the answered questions uh, because we are already... Um, over nine minutes of the time. So <laughs> thank you very much everyone for uh, joining us in this session. It's a very short one and a half hours. Yeah, I, we hope that we 
can have the next session again with you. So I'm going to defer this to Maya again. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you so much, Ibu Fini and the rest of the speakers. That was a very educative session. We hope to see you again next time. Now, the rest of you, please don't go anywhere because I have the name of the winner for our social media quiz today. Earlier in this event, I asked you guys, which state is home to Monterey Bay Aquarium? And the right answer is B, California. And our winner for today is Kin Kin Luin from Facebook. Congratulations, Kin Kin. Now, you may be wondering, how can I develop an awesome idea for a place like this? Easy. You can go to our website at www.atamerica.or.id, click create an event and collaborate with us. All proposals coming to us will be reviewed and your event might be featured here soon. And while you're on our website, don't forget to subscribe to our newsletters for weekly event updates sent straight to your inbox. All right, everybody, I think that wraps up this episode. It has been really fun, but unfortunately, we have to say goodbye for now. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at AT America for event updates, fun content, and so much more. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. All right, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Goodbye.